Welcome to A Place for Film, the IU Cinema Podcast. On this week's episode, we're talking about Dial M for Murder. Thank you guys very much. My name is Andy Hunsucker. Uh, Jason is sick this week, uh, and this is Chris Eller from the uh, Advanced Visualization Lab and uh, 3D expert, sorry, stereoscopic expert, and uh, <laughs> super fan. Super fan. Okay. Yeah. So dial in for murder. What do we think? We're good. We like that one. Um, that one's uh, that one's interesting because it was based off a play. So literally every scene happens in that one room except for the dinner party. That was pretty much it, right? Right. Uh, a couple exterior scenes. You notice even when uh, there was the trial that that happened in kind of an abstract space. So they didn't leave. Hitchcock commented on this that if they had changed locations that uh, people would start to think it was a second picture or something like <laughs> yes. that. Yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about the 3D aspect of this real quick, Chris. Um, was this film a huge hit in 3D? Um, unfortunately, it came in on, uh, on the tail end of 3D popularity. Uh, I think Hitchcock was saying that 3D was popular for nine days, and he, he made this on the ninth day. <laughs> um, so it, it was one of the best made, technically speaking, but uh, there were some other movies that had already not been well received, so the interest was uh, on the decline, unfortunately. I did see Jim Naramore, our old pal Jim Naramore, uh, just before the, uh, the, the film, and he said he had had a debate with one of his film scholar friends about the best 3D made films, and he said Dial in for Murder was one, Kiss Me Kate was the other, but then Jim threw in Creature from the Black Lagoon. He thought that was the third great actual film shot in 3D. He could be right. Yeah. So let's talk about the technical side of this. Nowadays, we have digital cameras, and you can just sort of tell the computer, make sure these frames are sort of in the same general vicinity. Well, how there's they... a lot more manual adjustments yes. for that, but in general, yes. So how did they do it back in the 50s? Well, for this particular uh, uh, movie, they did shoot with what's called a dual band system. So they did use two cameras. There were methods that used a single camera and a single strip of film, but for this one, they used two cameras. It, it was a new camera that Warner was trying to develop called their all format camera. The idea was that they could build this one camera and it could shoot any aspect ratio, 2D or 3D. And uh, part of it, some people think it was so they wouldn't have to license the uh, natural vision camera, which was kind of a commercially available camera that they had to pay to, to use. That's what they shot uh, Buona Devil and um, House of Wax on. They shot about a little over a dozen, uh, 16, I think, films on the natural vision camera. Uh, but they wanted to build their own. And so they shot this, Hondo, Kiss Me Kate, and a couple other films uh, with this camera. It's very similar. It's just two cameras and uh, a piece of glass called a beam splitter, which we'll talk about later, if at all. Yeah. <laughs> so the other technical thing that I think most people are kind of curious about, and I know the answer, but I want you to answer it. Why was there an intermission? This movie was like less than two hours long. I was hoping you'd ask that, actually. <laughs> um, at the time, uh, normally in a, in a cinema, like the one we have here where they, you have film, there's two projectors, and what often happens is they go from a reel on one projector and then change over to the reel on the second projector, back to the first, back to the second. And that's how you can have uninterrupted films. Um, but a, a 3D presentation, a dual band 3D presentation, where they shoot, they have left film and right film, they have to use both projectors at the same time. So they need that intermission in order for the projectionist to change over for the second half of the movie. Uh, there was a theater venue uh, in LA that actually was equipped with four projectors. So they were when this premiered in 54, um, they were able to show it without the intermission on that one. But that's one of the only houses that could do that at the time. And by the way, it was delayed to 54 because of the play. They shot the movie in 53, but part of the contractual agreement was the play was still uh, being staged, and they had to wait until the play left the theater before they could screen this in the cinema, hence the delay to 1954 and also the decline of 3D's popularity. If it had been screened in 53, it may have had a, a better reception in yeah. 3D. Yeah. So as I understand it, this film came out in 3D, and basically the theater owners just refused 
to play it in 3D. Is that about accurate? Uh, yes and no. It, it did have, in, in 54, it did have some good screenings, uh, but it was somewhat sporadic, and there was this backlash against some 3D, against bad 3D. So Warner was pressured to allow the cinemas the option of screening it flat is what they call it. And so they even made the, the posters and all the, the, the broadsides and whatnot. The 3D, uh, they, what did they call it? Not a stinger. Um, but uh, the, the 3D badge part of the poster was actually separate. So they, or the 3D was, it was on the very bottom of the poster and they could cut it off or fold it. So if they wanted to show it flat, um, there was a story that it was shown in Grace Kelly's hometown. It was supposed to be their first special uh, engagement, and uh, they screened it, I think, a day and a half, and the attendance kept dropping because they were having trouble with the projection. With that sort of setup, if your projectors get out of sync or there's other issues, you'll have what's called out-of-phase issues in the presentation, and it's incredibly uncomfortable to watch. And the, the theater owner was calling Warner Brothers to say, you got to let us screen this flat. And then the next day, so they screened it for a day and a half, and then that following evening, they were advertising, no glasses required. <laughs> it was actually part of the posters. They would put out flyers for the, or posters that say, dial in for murder, see it without glasses. And it was an advertising thing just because of these technical difficulties with keeping two projectors in sync. It was quite a challenge. Luckily, with digital projection, uh, the synchronization is guaranteed. Yeah. So you also teach the 3D uh, production class where, where students actually make 3D films at Indiana University, Chris. So mm -hmm. anything in here that you would have set Hitchcock down and said, you know what, that's not a good idea in 3D? They actually did a lot, just about everything right. Uh, in the, I shouldn't say right. That's pretentious. Um, <laughs> They had very few technical uh, flaws. Their stereographer, who I believe worked on uh, House of Wax uh, just the prior year, uh, they did their homework and they did everything very well. The technical aspects of this presentation were very good. You notice there were a couple rough areas and there's reasons for those. Uh, but the state of the art with the technology at the time, they did a great job with what they presented. and and. Specifically, they wanted to, because you know, it's 3D, you can have 3D where a part of the scene comes out of the screen into the audience space, that's called negative parallax. And you can also relax back behind the screen into the theater space, which is positive parallax. And almost everything in this entire film is back in positive parallax. So the, the proscenium that we have here in the screen acts as a window into the world of the movie rather than the movie coming out into our space. And, and that's a bit safer to do because you don't yeah. have to worry about some technical gotchas that happen when you come into negative parallax. A few, a few uh, exceptions. You notice when the inspector held the key out right there, that key was hanging out at us. Uh, I'm told on the set when they were getting ready to film that they had put a piece of tape on the floor where they calculated the screen plane would be. And they made sure that the inspector, only his arm came through to hold the film, as well as with her hand. When she's yeah. being attacked and her hand reaches out on the desk, they knew that that would come out into the audience. That was some of their shock value. Yeah. Well, I also noticed there was a lot of sort of foreground pieces. Uh, there's a lot of lamps. There's a lot of bottles. There's Those a lot of lamps. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody notices the lamps. I mean, you see them, and the camera pans, and this lamp moves, and it's always up here. Though you notice the lamp is almost always at the screen, and everything is happening behind that. They did that to have layers, a foreground, mm -hmm. mid-ground, yeah. background, and the camera in moving introduces what's called motion parallax, which gives you a real sense of the space uh, the volume that's recorded by the stereo camera rig. Yeah. Anybody out in the audience have any comments about quality of 3D? Did it hurt anybody? Yeah. So the question is about the glasses, if they use the red and cyan or red and blue, uh, green and red, anaglyph glasses. That, the type... Do you want to answer this one? No, you go right ahead. No, uh, and well, yeah. So the type of glasses used depends on the projection system at the venue. So if they received a print, that's called anaglyph when it uses color filters like that, primary color filters. And so that would have happened if the theater received an anaglyph print where the left view and the right view are printed on top of each other with a color filter. You can then play that in a regular projector on a regular screen 
and and any and people can view it, but it it it's very hard to view anaglyph for long periods of time. It hurts my brain, and it probably hurts a lot of people's brains. So the glasses that we have here, this is a system called Dolby Infotech, which also uses color filters. But instead of one eye getting only red and one eye getting only cyan, which is green and blue together, these glasses filter red, green, and blue for each eye, but slightly different red, green, and blue. And that's the system that they've installed here. The system at Showplace East and West, that uses polarized filters on the glasses and polarized filters on the projector, but they have to have a special screen. So the glasses, the screen, and the projector, the filtration on the projector all work together as a system. So different venues. Now they have shown anaglyph here. They did uh, the yeah. stewardesses. Yes, um, in cinema anaglyph. classic. <laughs> yes, sure, maybe, uh, a certain type of classic. Um, but as I understand, uh, that was a midnight screening. That was past my bedtime, so I, yeah. I wasn't able to come. But Andy made it, yeah. and there were some difficulties. The, the 3D was not good. Uh, you would see a lot of stuff where, like they had a pool cue, and it was like their 3D gag, and it would come at the screen. But except the pool cue sort of like shifted. It like came at the center, and then it kept going. So one went this way, and one went that way. Um, well, that's didn't... how the 3D is supposed to work. Well, no, except... But the filter... Yes. So film ages, uh, actual celluloid film ages, and one of the things that goes, uh, they can go, is color, the color fidelity of the film. And anaglyph, that filtration method, relies on color to be accurate. So the, the color of the lenses in your glasses and the color of the filtration on the film should match. But when the film ages, those colors no longer match, and, and you have uh, crosstalk. Uh, so the left eye sees the left image and some of the right image, and the right eye sees the right image and some of the left image, which is not what you want. Yeah, and, and it can be a polarized system. Oftentimes, when this was screened, it was screened in, in venues that did use polarized glasses. So the same glasses that you use over Showplace, if you time travel back to 1954, you could wear those same glasses and use on, on their system as well. Yeah, uh, same technology. That, that's how one of the first uh, 3D movies was screened in 1922, was with that system. So yeah. it's been around for... No. The important distinction is with the film, there's the film, the movie, a 3D movie is two 2D movies, uh, but the footage comes from the two different cameras, the left camera and the right camera. So those, those two reels of film were scanned and then packaged into a, a digital cinema package. Now this same digital cinema package could be taken over to Showplace and shown on their polarized system and it would just work because the, the, the DCP doesn't know what the system is that, that we're using Dolby Infotech, that they're using uh, real D pol polarization. No, uh, the the way the film is scanned doesn't doesn't do any sort of filtration at all. The what, what the images that are processed into the digital film do not have any sort of filtration on them. They're clean images. Okay. The projector is filtering. What's happening is as each frame, uh, as a frame of the left eye comes through, there's a little wheel inside the projector, and half of that wheel is the left lens material, and the other half is the right lens, and the wheel's spinning. So then when, uh, when the left frame comes through the, from the light engine out toward the lens, the left half of the filter wheel is in, in the light path, and it gets filtered for that light Every other frame. This projector does every other frame. It's called a frame interleave and a frame sequential presentation. Some projectors have two lenses, and um, there's a filter over each lens, and the two images are projected through concurrently at the same time. You can tell if you go to a 3D show and you look back at the projection booth, if you see two little rectangles of light, it's that method. If you see one little rectangle of light, it's this method. Yeah. Sorry for the long. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Any other c comments about the the quality of the 3D? Go ahead and wait for the mic so we get you on the on the recording here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I just want to talk more about flaws. Um, for uh, for instance, uh, my my eyes hurt uh, mm -hmm. sometimes when the camera panned rather fast. Same for me. Same for me. Uh, I get into the technical problems. Of, yeah. That or other flaws. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a mechanical flaw. So this um, uh, this all format, all media camera was a big behemoth, and you noticed that when it was relatively still, um, that the synchronization of the frames was pretty good. I also noticed a little bit of judder, just a little bit, but that's because these two cameras are pulling down film inside of them, and their motors attached, and there's mechanical movement in the cameras. Um, but when it would dolly, 
and move around. If the track wasn't perfectly smooth or if the dolly grip moved it a little too hard or a little too slow, the rig would flex just a little bit or the mirror, the, the beam splitter, the, the glass that's inside there between the cameras would woggle just a little bit. And the result that we see here is there is motion that is different for each eye. And your brain does not like that <laughs> whatsoever. But what about the rest of the film? For most of it, were you comfortable? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, that's good. You, yeah. yeah, but I'm glad you noticed that, because it was Yeah, I had bad. that same, same experience. Yeah. What was up with the uh, double image in the left eye? Because that was a little uncomfortable. Okay, so, so she asked about double image, yeah. Um, not all of the clips for each of the scenes survive in good condition for both the left and the right eye. The, the, the color process they used here is called Warner Color, and, and the film base they used wasn't terribly stable. And so this was, they tried to do an initial restoration in, in 1979, and I think it was 79 or 82. Uh, there, there were two events at 79 and 82, uh, 79. And the color was off on a lot of these uh, shots. It, it had yellowed. Um, so, they had to either go to, they couldn't go back to the camera negative, or they had to go to some one of the interpositives uh, of, that, uh, of that print. And sometimes they couldn't get a good pair. So what they would do is just replicate the best eye for a little scene. Toward the end, when the inspector is on the phone and he pulls out his little comb and is combing his mustache, you notice that was a flat scene. So that was one of them where, for example, they, just the left eye version of the film was in better shape than the right eye. So they just used that left eye film on both sides. Both eyes are presented the same scene or the same film from the same perspective. So it's a flat image. And then they kind of gave it a quasi 3D by pushing it back into positive parallax just a little bit. But it's the same image. So that was a problem with film degradation. Yeah. The other thing I noticed is they used a lot of rear projection in this. Does rear projection work in 3D, Chris? Well, you tell me. What do you think? So when the, the, the street scenes outside, the ship arriving down yeah. at the wharf, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to say no. No. What did you see? What did you perceive? Anybody in the audience? What did you think? I thought the last shot at the beginning was just going to walk right into the screen. Yeah. Yeah, and he almost did walk into the screen. So in 2D... Um, they can use these background plates and put somebody out in the African savanna. They found this with, in two years before with Buana Devil because they had a lot of stock footage shot of the African savanna. Uh, that's a movie about two lions that eat a bunch of railroad workers. <laughs> Exciting stuff. <laughs> um, but when they then screen, so then they, they shot the actors in 3D in the studio against that 2D plate. So when you see it, in 3D, in stereoscopic 3D, I should be careful about my terms. You look at it and you say, wow, those actors are standing in front of a screen. Because <laughs> you can clearly see the, the, the material, you know, the, the scene is monoscopic being projected behind them. So, yeah. yeah, it's one of the things where some of the Hollywood tools that work great in 2D do not work well in 3D. Yeah. And, I, you know, just skipping forward in time a little bit, Peter Jackson found out that uh, all his forced perspective tricks. Uh, from the original Lord of the Rings trilogy does not work in 3D. That's right. Forced perspective to make hobbits small and humans tall. That kind of rhymes. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, relies on only being a monoscopic camera, one eye. Um, so for The Hobbit, if anybody saw The Hobbit in 3D, anybody see that? Really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, they had to digitally shrink than the, the dwarf and hobbit actors. They still had body doubles for, for yeah. longer shots where just because digital manipulation at that scale is really expensive. But for the scenes where they needed uh, the hero actors, the actual actors, then yeah, they, they, they digitally shrunk them. Yeah. A lot of green screen work in that film as well. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about the film mm -hmm. itself. Um, what do you think, Chris? I, I like this film a lot, but in a lot of ways, when you look at Hitchcock's other work, it kind of sticks out to me. It sticks out to him as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he comments on this scene, uh, this film being the, essentially the filming of a play, and a, a particular type of play. I'm not going to try to pronounce the German word, but it would be called a chamber play, um, where uh, 
a lot of, or all the action takes place inside one room or one mm-hmm. residence. And, and Hitchcock did some of his early work filming in Germany, so he would have been familiar with these chamber plays. And so he made a chamber movie in this case. Uh, he also didn't do what he calls ventilate the play, because sometimes when a play <laughs> makes the transition yeah. to the screen, you know, on a play they talk about, oh, back, you know, I just arrived here, there was a problem with the carriage, blah, blah. Yeah. In a movie, they tend to show you that. Yes. And in a play, they tell you about it, which is what happened here. Yeah, I feel like this could be called Exposition the Movie. Every single scene, like, the, it starts with two scenes of people explaining things at length. And then the only scene that really is like a normal scene from a normal movie is when the detective is talking to the couple and trying to get their stories. That's what I feel like is like the sort of standard movie scene. Everything else is kind of like, let me explain to you this thing that you're not going to see. We were at the train station, remember? And I took your bag, and I have this letter, and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. That's, they, they took the, the, the inversion of the classic movie rule, show, don't tell. They did tell, don't show. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, though, actually works toward the characters, because that allowed the... Um, what was his name? Not Wen- Mr. Wendis. Mr. Oh. Wendis. I'm going with Mr. Wendis. Mr. Wendis to put some spin onto what... Yes. So that allows him to plant suggestions so that she would maybe think what he wanted her to think. Yeah. I, th- I think it's a brilliant acting job because the guy is basically, you know, he plays the, the character up to a point and then he's playing a different character, the mm-hmm. guy that didn't plan to murder his wife for about the next third of the movie. And then at the very end, I started following this Twitter account called So Very British. And I feel like <laughs> that last scene when he's like, well, I'm caught. I'm Uh-oh. just going to make a drink. You want to drink, guys? Anybody want to drink? <laughs> yes, very British. <laughs> that would that would fit right in there. Oh, with the so very, very polite. British. Exactly. Very polite. Exactly. I also love there's that great moment. And I, you know, you don't catch it the first time you see it, but this is the second time I saw it. And I caught it this time when he drops the letter very suggestively. And that's another one so very British. You pick up the piece of evidence for the person across from you so that your fingerprints get on the letter. Yes, which has been used in other movies. Yes, exactly. Yeah, very British in there. Uh, an inter- another thing, fun thing to point out uh, with the 3D, go- or this story, so the pacing of the story is uh, not long. I can't remember if it's, but when did Rope come out? Anybody remember? 49. So right then, he tried to do a trick where it was always the long take. He wants the long take right there, which a couple years prior, he wanted to cut everything up because he wanted to tell a cinematographic story. I think that's the term he used. Yeah. And w- do it all through cuts and angles. And then he wanted to do rope, which was technically a trick. But it, it's actually 11, 11 scenes that are seamlessly cut together, so you don't perceive the cuts through various means. And this film actually had closer to six or seven hundred cuts in it. So far different than what he was doing with Rope. And, and yeah. also far different than a lot of 3D movies. They try to go for the longer cut in the 3D movies because it lets your eyes relax into it and creates what's called dwell time. Because if you noticed, when they were ever there in the apartment, you, okay, yeah, they're talking, you're looking. But then you're also looking over here. You're looking at the books. You're looking at the bottles on the on the sideboard. You're looking over here, and you're looking mm-hmm. at that damn lamp. <laughs> <laughs> and that's dwell time and exploration of the scene. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely works. The other thing, now, I don't know if, was, was Strangers on a Train before this or after this? 51. Thank you. Did anyone else catch the reference to Strangers on a Train? The guy saying, oh, it would be great. I, I should write this story where... Uh, you commit the perfect murder, and it'll have a tennis subplot. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, there was a tennis person there. Yeah. yeah. And everybody saw Hitchcock, right? Yeah. I heard a big laugh in the crowd when he showed up. Yeah. He it's was, okay if you didn't. He was in the reunion photo when yeah. he, early on in the film. He was sitting at the table looking back like, why are you taking more picture? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone out in the audience have any comments about the film? Want to throw in uh, your two cents? Go ahead and wait for the mic there. The glass is upside down, which is kind of interesting because it makes the background kind of in the foreground. Yep, that creates a that creates a, a a situation called false stereo, where your eyes are getting the the incorrect information. So the depth that's created by the two different perspectives. By the way, okay, the reason we see in 3D is because we have two eyes and they're next to each other. They're not right on top of each other. They're next to each other. And each eye perceives the world through a slightly different perspective. Your brain fuses those together through a process called stereopsis. 
when that works correctly, you see the world in depth. When you reverse them like that, you get these three-dimensional depth cues, and the perspective is backward, and it looks very funky. Mm -hmm. it's, a false, it's a false depth cue there. Uh, if anybody's looked at any of the work by MC Escher, where he has objects that should be behind something, crosses in front of it, that's what false stereo can look like. I don't recommend doing it often, but you should yeah. try it sometime. It's interesting. <laughs> that would be an interesting thought experiment. What would, how would you film a 3D movie, or how would, how would that work if your eyes were in different places on your head? Well, we, we can simulate that with a camera. So you can get yeah. like the alien's eye view. You know, like in, in the classic War of the Worlds, they had the color filter in front of the camera. So when it was the alien view, you kind of saw the world in kind of three sections with different colors in there. Yeah. So you could do the alien view with weird camera positions. Yeah. It wouldn't be comfortable, though. Any other comments from the crowd? There's Torlando way Let's back wait there. For, Here uh, wait comes for, the microphone. Wait for the microphone so we get you on the recording here. Better be worth it. I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, after you had talked about how the, uh, the movie was adapted from a play, um, I, I started to think about why they hadn't gone to the lengths of, you know, if you're going to take a story and, and start using the tools of a, of a movie, why not use the tools of a movie? But then I thought, well, it's in 3D. So in what ways were they using... 3D as a, a narrative tool, and you know, and, and why hadn't they done that in other ways? That's all you. This is great. Yeah, this falls onto. Uh, I'm kind of working on a hypothesis. The spectrum of 3D. Um, on one end of the spectrum, we call um, stereo veritas, which is uh, 3D that's recorded in as realistic a way as possible to have be an accurate representation of what you would see. And on the other end of the spectrum is stereo fabula, where you are trying to work the 3D and the depth into some uh, meaning to support aspects of the film. And this seemed to fall under, and there are several examples of this, usually documentaries, on the stereo veritas side of that spectrum. Uh, two prior examples that have been screened here, uh, Cave of Forgotten Dreams and Pina, were both movies where they wanted to record the 3D to be an accurate representation of the world. And what I think they were doing here works on a couple levels there that they wanted, again, that accurate representation, because this is the filming of a play in essence, but not the way like PBS would do it or the BBC would do it where, where the film, where the cameras are always where the audience could be as if it were a play. By the way, when you go to see a play, I'm gonna let you in on a dirty little secret, that's in 3D. <laughs> For most people, not everybody, there's some people that don't see in 3D, it's okay. But that's in 3D, and what we have here is a play in 3D, but it's not just camera views from the audience perspective in this case, and this is what goes into those uh, chamber plays, the German kind of chamber play music, which I can't pronounce the German word for, it's like huge, um, where the camera then moves into the scene. It's usually from the one wall that we hardly ever see with the bookcases mm -hmm. on the back. That was what's called their wild wall. So uh, <laughs> when they were filming from there, that wall I was actually moved out of the way of the set so they could work around behind it because this was a huge camera when they were working in it. Um, Grace Kelly, not Grace Kelly. Yes, yes Grace, Grace Kelly. Kelly. I'm thinking Kelly Grace. She's got that last name, first name thing. Um, said, oh, it's as big as the house, or it's as big as a room. And it's like, it wasn't really, but, I mean, it was huge, but it was not that gigantic. Where was I going with that? Yeah, so the, the camera can move into the scene with the actors. And you notice there were times when, when Mr. Wendis was talking with Mr. Swan to convince yes. him when he first came over that the camera orbited all the way around with them. So it acted, it's that floating camera technique that was developed as cameras became smaller and smaller and smaller. So a lot of the cinematographers were like, what the f we can move the camera around and it's easy and we can get into the scene. We're not just recording a scene through this fourth wall. Yeah. So it is, yes, it is very play-like in some aspects. But the 3D in this case, I think, was more of the realistic 3D that was just trying to faithfully record the way the, the scene would have looked had you been there in the place of the camera. Yeah. I think it's a real credit to the, the, the quality of the story, the quality of the writing, that a movie like this, where it's literally just 
let's look at what's happening in this room, can be that compelling. There's these great little moments as you're, you know, as you're watching when, you know, he's he set up this big plan and then he's talking to his wife and that first thing happens where it's all going to start to unravel, uh, you know, oh no, I'm going to go to a movie. Yes. Wait, you, what? You, yeah, <laughs> the look on his face of terror. You can't leave, you have to die. Yeah. And it's it's great. It's one of those it's one of those things that, you know, you can't experience in real life. You can only experience it at the movies or in a play where you know a lot more than the people in the scene know. Um, and the movie does a great job, I think, of always letting us in on just enough, like a good mystery should, but then still at the end, you don't, it left out that one little piece, that that key was left under that mat. Right, that was, we had to sleuth that out. Yes. And this, uh, some of that follows under uh, Hitchcock's thoughts on surprise versus suspense. Yes. Right there. You've heard, you've all heard surprise versus suspense, right? On this one? Of course you have. No. Well, we'll mention. If yeah. you, all right. So if you have a scene with two people sitting at a table and. Nice outdoor cafe. Yes. And a bomb explodes, that's surprise. Ah! Blew up. Suspense, on the other hand, you see them talking, but then the camera goes under the table and you see the bomb and you and see the timer. And it's ticking down. And it's ticking. And whatever they're talking about suddenly has this heightened importance because you know that they're both in a lot of trouble and that's when people yell at the screen move go away and they don't and they blow up and that's yeah. suspense that's a lot more audience participation so yeah there there are things that we're yeah. privy to um, but not everything because he does everything. want us to work a little bit yes uh, and i think it's another credit to the film and the credit to hitchcock that by the end you really think okay this movie's about to end this guy's going to get away with it that's pretty harsh like, it's, he's just going to walk away from this, and this movie could end right now, and that could be the ending, that this woman just yeah. goes to jail. It's and the day before the execution. Yeah. But the inspector comes back, because you weren't yeah. thinking that he was going to come back yeah. on that one. I think one of the other comments we talked about, just the way you know Hitchcock didn't ventilate the play uh, to, to make more of a movie, uh, and he has said, and again, whenever we take quotes from folks, you know, there's always a little bit of grain of salt right there. But uh, some people think that he was coasting a little bit. He was finishing this last project so he could get on to his next big project, which destroyed at the box office. That would be Rear Window. So this, you know, he said, you know, he was treading water. He was playing it safe. He was just getting through the project and, you know, being a little creative. You know, yeah. it was the first time he had done 3D. Um, and this was also one of the early, earlier examples of him uh, going to widescreen, uh, the flat aspect ratio, 1.85 to 1. Not, not CinemaScope, but wider than he had been working in in the past, as well as color. Yes. So that was another fun one. They had to learn to work with color and 3D and widescreen at the same time. Yeah, so you can understand why he might have played it a little bit safe and worked in this space where he was very comfortable with here's the room and we can do everything in this room and I understand, you know, day one I learned what this corner of the room can do and day two I understand, okay, now what I've got over here and I, I, I can understand why that would make sense. Yep, they got some statements where they, they, they shot some stuff and he looked at the dailies and, and was just blown away by how bad he thought it looked because there's a lot of empty space in there. And I think that's then where these lamps showed up yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to fill up some of that space. And, and yeah, and you notice the, the, big, the big scene, the giant phone where they're supposed to dial the M for murder. And you notice this gigantic finger that comes in to dial the number right there. That was because they couldn't, they couldn't get a real good close up with a real hand with that camera at the time. They, they're not good enough, at least to film. So the, he had them, and there are pr promotional photos of Hitchcock with this phone. It's gigantic. You know, the dial is like three feet across and whatnot, so that that camera could film it realistically. Yeah. Well, are there any other comments about the film? Did you did you like it? What, what did you think about seeing it in 3D? Because th this has been screened in 3D on three kind of separate eras right there. It had its brief screenings in 3D in 54, but those tapered off fairly quickly. And then it was revived again in 79 with the color problems and still the film problems where the projection could get bad. They did it again in 82 with a single strip method where both the left and the right views are squeezed and put into the same frame. By the way, this is how 3D TV works. 
And then there's a special lens on the projector that unsqueezes those and projects it on the screen. But that, because you, you have to squeeze a lot of this information down, it, it, the resulting image, uh, there's a loss of clarity and sharpness with that, so it wasn't very well received. And then this was rescanned in, in 2011 and, and restored. They fixed the color problems from the Warner color degradation and created the DCP. And this, this showed in 2012 at the Toronto National Toronto International Film Festival, and now it's screened here. So you're kind of in the third era of seeing Dial-In for Murder in 3D proper. Yeah. Yeah. There's a comment one question back there from Leah. Get the mic back there. Yeah. Um, I have kind of a, a comment and a question, I guess. Um, my comment is that um, 3D aside, I think I really liked the movie, but I think I, I hadn't seen it before tonight. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that Rope, as, as an example of a movie that was written as a play first, I feel like that kind of, uh, to me, uh, was a little more suspenseful in, in certain ways. I think this one was funnier. And mm -hmm. um, in regards to the 3D, I think that it looked really nice. The, the only time that it seemed strange to me was when they were filming outdoors, like it seemed like it was like a painted background with, yeah. with yep. like, you know what I mean? Can you explain why it is that way? Yep, actually, maybe you were down in the loo or something, but we, yeah, we, we mentioned that, yeah, that was because that's, that's filming two actors in front of a projected screen. So in 3D, you can clearly see that they're standing in front of a screen right there. The 3D reveals the trick. Yeah, so that's a problem right there. Yeah, all those were goofy. Yeah. Well, I think we'll get out of here. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, thank you, Chris, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Be safe coming home. And uh, I'm Andy, and this has been and always will be a place for film. A place for film is recorded at WFIU Studios in Bloomington, Indiana.